Hello everyone and welcome to another Nature Life Online. Now my name is Christina and I'm going to be your host and I'm delighted to be able to take these amazing shows that we normally do at the Natural History Museum in London right to your homes uh, from us. Now uh, today we are going to be talking about these animals that lived a long, long time ago, and uh, some of you might have seen, and some of you might recognize as some of most of the, the most famous fossils that are around the ammonites. Now, I'm not an expert on ammonite, so uh, I'm going to be asking all my questions to our very, very special guest today. But you can ask questions as well. Please send them through. I think uh, people have already been sending loads of questions, uh, but keep sending questions and I'll be asking them to Soy Hughes, who is our curator of cephalopods and brachiopods at the museum. Hi Zoe, how are you doing? Hello. I'm good, thank you, Hi. how are you? Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so, so happy that you could join us today. All right. Now, I've got loads of questions, so are you ready to talk about ammonites and its relati relatives? I am. Yes, I am. Brilliant. <laughs> but before we start talking about them, I said that you're curator of cephalopods yeah. and brachiopods, the fossil versions of those. Okay. What does that mean? What do you do at the Natural History Museum? Okay, so um, basically I look after the collections and a very big part of my job is to provide access to the collections. So that could be um, researchers from around the world, that could also be people from exhibitions, people like yourself who want to know a bit more about things. Um, I do tours for kids sometimes. Um, yeah, so I look after about 9,000 drawers of fossils, which is quite a lot. Um, you can see one of them in the picture there. Um, <laughs> sometimes I have to get in touch with our conservation staff if I found a little problem, um, all sorts of things. I spend a lot of my life looking at Excel spreadsheets. Um, I sometimes I'm allowed out to go do some field work. Um, I also do a bit of my own research and go to conferences to pre present that work. Um, yeah, it's a really varied job. And <laughs> um, it looks like a very exciting job as well. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. And thank you so much for providing such an amazing background. Very, very in the theme with the it's talk. Quite all right. That is what <laughs> I have around. <laughs> So let's talk about, about your background, about ammonites and its relatives. We're going to be talking about nautiloids as well, who are um, related to ammonites. But I think if we're going to talk about, we need to uh, put them in the big map of animals that are on the on the world. Now, you, we mentioned before that you've got cephalopods. Ammonites and nautiloids are cephalopods. But what does that mean? That's a big word. Okay, so um, they are one of the major groups of mollusks. Um, mollusks are a really massive group, um, not quite as big as the insects, but there's a lot of them. Um, and there's a lot of groups of mollusks within that. There's some smaller groups, um, like the chitin, which is the picture closest to Christina on the screen. Um, and I don't know why I'm showing behind me. Uh, <laughs> and then um, there's some smaller groups, uh, bigger groups as well, even. Um, so the three major groups of mollusks are the gastropods, that is everything like slugs and snails. And that literally means stomach foot. So if you think about how a snail moves along, it sort of sneaks along on its stomach. Um, then another big group is the bivalves. That literally means two shells. So that encompasses everything like that really big clam there, um, oysters, mussels, scallops, that sort of thing, the really tasty ones. Um, and then the group that I look after, um, the fossil cephalopods. That is everything like your ammonites, your nautiloids, and another little group within that of all of the octopuses, cuttlefish, squid, uh, belemnites, which are extinct. Um, there's loads of them. They're really diverse. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, how, how about this big group and how they've been um, around for a long time. Uh, yeah, we're going to be focusing on the ammonites and the nautiloids, which I can see that they have shells um, and not like the other uh, cephalops that we can see in that picture. So um, those ones are different because they have external shells, but the mm. other group, the coleoids, which are the other group of them, um, they 
have shells or their ancestral forms had shells. Some of them don't anymore, but they tend to be inside them. Um, so if you think about the pen in a squid, that is okay. the shell inside that. Okay, that makes um, a lot of um, a, a lot of sense. Now, why why do they have the why do they have the external shell? What is it? What, how is it useful for them for this uh, particular group? Um, so it obviously would provide a little bit of protection, um, but mainly it is full of lots of chambers, and that allows the animal to behave almost like a submarine, um, mm -hmm. moving up and down in the water column. So it can sort of have a bit of a choice of where it wants to be. Um, so yeah, on the screen at the moment, we've got a fossil ammonite and also a fossil, north uh, no, that's a recent nautilus, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I saw any specimens. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so this is the shells. And if we cut those in half, you can see that you've got a really big gap at the side of the Nautilus, so the one closest to us. And then mm -hmm. you've got lots, lots of little shell, little chambers in that shell. The ammonite, the one furthest away, you can see, obviously, this is uh, a fossil, so it is a rock. And you can see in that, there's a little arrow that points to something. That is where an organ called the siphuncle would go through. In Nautilus, it goes right through the middle of the shell. In ammonites, usually it goes right around the outside of the shell. Okay, so that, uh, that's a good trick to tell them apart. Looking at the middle, really good trick. yeah. Although you have to have the shell open, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I find it really, really cool that they they work a bit like submarines. So they're like nature submarines in. in yeah. So in a really simple sense, um, they use that siphon call to fill those chambers with either air or water. If they fill it with mm -hmm. water, then the animal sinks. If they fill it with air, then it floats. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the simplest explanation. <laughs> I can imagine them just bobbing around like that. Yeah. Now, to understand a little bit more about ammonites, um, I think it's fair enough to look at this group, the nautiloids, who look a little bit like them and understand them a little bit better. Is that something that scientists do? Do you look at similar animals to understand more the ones that have become extinct? So, That is a lot of what we do, because obviously we don't have the full animals preserved in the fossil record, but we have to be careful. Um, particularly with comparing ammonites and nautilus, because we actually think that nautilus is a more distant relative to the ammonites than all of those other cephalopods, like the octopuses mm -hmm. and squid. We think the ammonites are closer related to them. Um, oh. So we have to be careful. While their shells worked in a very similar way, they actually probably have more in common in terms of like their body anatomy with the coleoid group. So that's all the octopuses and things. Oh, that's really cool. So even though they yeah. look similar, and they're useful to understand the, the way they, they live regarding the shell but they're more oh, yeah. related to the other one that's really cool so let's let's talk a little bit about the the nautilus then um and and how they live they're still alive around today which they is are, really yeah. cool and can you tell us a little bit more about um the the way of of life where do we find them um where how do they live how do they swim so um they are found a lot around really beautiful places so um the south pacific uh northern australia sort of in the indian <laughs> ocean so really hard places to go and uh, study them sadly i'm not a recent nautilus scientist um <laughs> and yeah but if we look at this image which has kindly been given to us um to, by the field museum in chicago um we can see we've cut they've cut away part of the shell so you can see that siphon going through those little holes in the shell um quite nicely but you can also see that the animal itself lives entirely in that body chamber so that shell all of those little chambers remain empty so they can do their buoyancy control. This is a really, really cool picture because sometimes when you see shells, it's a little bit difficult to imagine the animal inside. So it's really cool that we're able to see it like this. Yeah. Um, and they have, the Nautilus have a lot of tentacles, don't they? Many, they many. Do. So they've got about 90 tentacles. And this is one of the ways that they differ quite a lot from what we think an ammonite would have looked like. Um, so, a nautilus tentacles are very different to the tentacles of a squid. Um, and we think that because ammonites were closer related to the coleoids, so like the octopuses and things, it's more likely that they had arms. So um, I've got a little octopus friend. to. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a cuddly toy, so he's not the most accurate. Um, but basically, a lot of people think that octopuses have eight tentacles. They actually have eight arms. And the difference between an arm and a tentacle in an octopus or a squid is if you imagine you've got your whole arm, the suckers, this is where it really struggles, uh, the suckers go all the way down right to where the mouth is in the centre where my finger is there. Um, an arm, no, that's an arm, uh, a tentacle is, sorry, <laughs> I don't have the space here, 
basically a tentacle only has suckers at the end and then this part is smooth and they tend to be longer if you think about what a squid looks like. So we don't think that Ammonites had any of those tentacles. We just think they had arms um, and probably sort of eight to ten of them. That's really brilliant. That's a really good tip about, you know, in the future. So arm really? with whole, suckers covering the whole yeah. um, extremity and tentacles only at the end. That's really good yeah, to know. I don't have space to do my normal trick with my own arm here. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a show about um, cephalopods in general, octopus and a squid, uh, and mm -hmm. talk about that maybe in the future. Now, yeah. so we've been getting loads of questions from our viewers already and um, and we have one that is actually quite relevant we've been talking about nautilus how they're still alive um and foss uh, um, and ammonites the fossils that they uh, have become extinct they became extinct in the past why did the nautilus survived and why did the um ammonites became extinct do we know we don't know for sure because we can never really know these things for sure we can't go back in time um, but it is thought. So the Ammonites went extinct around the time when the dinosaurs went extinct, about 66 million years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing about Ammonites and Nautilus, Nautilus lives much deeper down in the ocean than the Ammonites. The Ammonites were actually relatively shallow living, whereas the Nautilus can get down to depths of about 700 metres. Um, so that was one factor. Basically, the deeper oceans, everything going on with the big meteorite and everything didn't affect the deeper oceans as much. The other thing when they hatch their eggs or hatch from their eggs ammonites are much smaller generally than nautilus nautilus broods for a bit longer and is a bit more advanced so it can eat a bit bigger food and it's just mm. a bit more capable of surviving out like harder times than those little tiny ammonites particularly as the shallower seas where the ammonites were living things were tougher anyway so that is possibly one of the major reasons but there may well be other reasons that i'm not aware of i'm not an extinction scientist so <laughs> that's really really cool but it's, it's really cool as well that we're not sure these are our hypotheses we, we are considering because we only have the the shells of the ammonites now so that's when it actually fits really well with my next question you said yeah. that the ammonites became extinct at the same time of the dinosaurs but uh, nautilus and ammonites how long were they around and have they been around um so nautilus was around much longer um, so they evolved around 495 million years ago, which is a really long time. And if you consider that they're still around today, that's kind of mind blowing. Um, Ammonites evolved um, their early forms about 400, 450 million years ago ish. Um, mm -hmm. And then they died out about 66 million years ago. So they were still around for a really long time, just less of a long time as nautiloids. Um, and yeah, you, you can compare that to dinosaurs. Um, so Stegosaurus, a really famous dinosaur. Obviously, we've got that beautiful specimen in the museum. Um, they were only around for about five million years. But if you compare that to humans, that's significantly longer than we've been around. There you go. And we have one of our questions we saw it on the screen. The was, did all ammonites became extinct uh, at that point? Um, so that's an amazing question. Um, so some of my colleagues who work in the States in a place called the Western Interior Seaway, which was basically a big sea, in the Cretaceous that went in, up the middle of uh, the USA. Um, there are some ammonites that actually survived a little bit past that extinction event, but not for very long. Oh, so, yeah, wow. that's a great question. That's a really, really good question. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited that we still find little things and we're like, oh, we found these new things, so maybe we should move that exchange. Yeah. Uh, we have another really, really good question, and I, th I think it has to do a lot with that we only have the shells of the ammonites. Do we yeah. know how could ammonites see? Um, they would have had eyes. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> don't know if you know anything about ammonite eyes. I don't know if I've ever found them. Um, in the museum, I look after the most amazing um, fossil octopus specimen that actually has its eyes preserved. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite cool. Um, Nautilus has eyes. They are we would call them simple eyes. They're almost like a pinhole camera. They're filled with water. So their vision wouldn't be amazing, but they can sort of see what's going on. So we don't know if they would have had eyes like a Nautilus. To my knowledge, we've never found any ammonite eyes. There might be some scientists out there who have. There are so many ammonites that I can't know about every single thing we've ever found. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I, they would have had eyes. I don't know what sort of eyes they would have had. I genuinely don't know. <laughs> Uh, and again, with the Cretaceous um, extinction question, there was another question attached, which was, do we know how did they reproduce? Which, again, 
we only have the shell. So can we tell how did ammonites um, reproduce, um, Zoe? Um, it would have been something similar to probably to modern coleoids um, or to modern cephalopods even. Um, actually, I've got a picture of Nautilus mating. I did have it came <laughs> behind me. Now. Um, so, yeah, essentially they... Um, so if we talk about octopuses, they have a special arm um, which they can... In, the male inserts this special arm into the female's mantle cavity um, and leaves a sperm packet. Um, some females in some species collect those up and decide when they want to fertilise themselves. Others don't. Um, there's also an awful lot of aggression and different methods of doing it. But again, because we can't go back and watch them mating, I would assume it's something like that. But yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. a system of proper re reproduction. As I said before, I just like that we look at animals that are still alive today that are similar yeah, exactly. to are extinct and try to figure out. Um, yeah. Now, they were really, really varied. You said that there's so, so many ammonites. I suppose the sizes were also varied. And we've had a question asking about the biggest one. Did they get okay. really Some of them get really massive. The biggest ones are from sort of Texas, New Mexico, Mexico area. I don't know where the biggest one exactly was found, but it was in that sort of area of the world. Um, and it's something called Parapososia. And they got massive. The biggest specimen we've got in our collection Oh, I can't remember what species it is, um, but full size, it probably would have been taller than me. Um, yeah, they they could get really big, but they also, there were some that were really, really small. There you go. I've got um, my own fossil specimen that I, I bought in Lyme Regis, and it's really, really tiny. But this doesn't mean yeah. that it's not an adult, right? They could have gotten really, really small as well, couldn't they? So Sorry. that one, to me, from, it's not easy to see, but that looks like <laughs> an ammonite called Promecoceros. Um, which is quite common in the Lyme Regis area. And that actually is quite a big one of those. Did they, these ones were a little bit smaller than that. Wow. They, most of the ones in our collections are smaller than that. So that actually looks like quite a big one. Uh, okay. And when they, they weren't only um, different in sizes, they also the shape of the shell is not always the usual spirally um, banded shell that we, that we see. No, it's not. And even the spiral ones can vary quite a lot. Some of them have, have whirls that sit atop each other. Some of them overlap. Um, some of them are really flat. Some of them are really chunky. Some of them had spines. Um, that's just wow. the spiral ones. Um, yeah, they, they did all sorts of things. It's quite a diverse group. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so many, many different ones. Do you have a favourite shell um, in particular or a favourite specimen yourself, Zoe? I do. Which... It's very hard. Often when you ask a curator if they have a favourite specimen, <laughs> um, it changes quite a lot. Because <laughs> just in terms of what work we're doing and what we have to be looking at. But my favourite ammonite is one from somewhere in Wiltshire called Trowbridge. It's not particularly special. I don't know if I've got a picture of it anywhere. Um, <laughs> and it's called Chamacetia. And I just, I bonded with this particular specimen when I was doing my master's thesis. And it was just an ammonite that I really liked. It gave me really good results in what I was doing. <laughs> I'm just quite fond of that one. It's not particularly special. It's not a type specimen. It's not been published everywhere. Um, I'm just quite fond of that one. Um, <laughs> but we do have some amazing historically important specimens found by great geologists through time. And yeah, it's amazing. We've got some amazing stories in the collections. Um, I I know that that was a little a, a bit of a difficult question, and I don't know as much as you do about ammonites. But um, one of the ammonites that you've shown me that is really really cool is one that hasn't got the normal shell. It's got kind of like a knotty shell. Um, yeah. And you've told me that it's just found in in Japan. Yeah. Um, so this is Nipponites. Um, so Nippon means Japan. Um, so the ammonite of Japan. Um, and okay. they were completely bizarre this is one oh i'm not very good at left and right when i'm so looking at myself yeah so this is nipponites and as you can see it looks kind of bizarre massively crazy um and this beautiful reconstruction um massive thank you to Franz for letting us use this um this is what they would have probably looked like we don't know how they would have lived what they were doing um <laughs> so that they appear in the fossil record in japan for a remarkably short period of time um, because this can't have been a very successful way to be an ammonite. Just <laughs> swimming around, that wouldn't be the best way to cut through the water. Um, yeah, they're just really bizarre. I love the really bizarre ones because you get some just mind-blowing shapes. And I think 
in my opinion, this is the weirdest ammonite that I've ever seen that I think exists in the world. <laughs> Um, it looks really, really weird. Never seen anything like that. Um, so not not only there are different uh, among different species and and different um, locations around the world, uh, yeah. but also within the same species as well. So even yeah. the sex might mean that the ammonites look different. Yeah. So um, cephalopods are really big for sexual dimorphism. Um, that is when the male and the female look radically different. So an example you've probably all seen is peacocks. The male's all fancy with his tail. The female's all dowdy and brown. Um, in cephalopods, the female is the bigger one. So this, um, these are actually the same species. The little spiny one is the male and the big <laughs> one is the female. Um, this is quite common that females are bigger than males in um, all cephalopods, actually. The example in the world today of the greatest size difference between the male and female of a species is a cephalopod. It's my favourite octopus that lives, called the blanket octopus. Um, and the female is about 40,000 times bigger than the male, mm -hmm. which is a lot. So the female's That's really cool. And the male's about an inch. That, I love yeah. those examples. I love those differences as well. I love that the females are the big ones. Yeah, it's quite, it's <laughs> quite empowering, isn't it? <laughs> That's really cool. Now, so with such variety with shells um, and also finding them in, in many, many different places, I suppose when in the past when people found them, they found these rocks that were spirally um, and had these particular shapes, people might have been a bit confused. And I don't mean 50 years ago, I mean 500 years ago, 200 years ago, even 100 years ago. What did, did we know what people thought about ammonites when they started finding them. Yeah, so some of these fossil folklore stories are amazing. I would suggest you go look some of them up. Um, but the ammonite one is my favourite. So this specimen that you can see a picture of, the snake's head isn't <laughs> natural. This has been carved onto it. And that is because they are also known as snake stones. People oh. believe that they are like snakes that have turned to stone. And this comes from um, a story in Whitby in North Yorkshire there was a woman called St Hilda and she had a magical whip. Apparently at the time, North Yorkshire had a massive problem with snakes. And so she was a star. She chased all the snakes off the moors with her magic whip, turning them into stone. So they all tumbled <laughs> off the and turned to stone. Um, she is revered in Whitby. You can see her in stained glass windows. You can also in some of them see little ammonites. And in the town... Um, coat of arms of Whitby there are ammonites in it so they're really important and she is also so important to ammonites that she has a whole genus named after her so that's the bit divided the, the division the bigger group after species so lots of species fit in a genus and that is called Hildoceros named after St Hilda who saved Yorkshire from snakes. That's amazing she's got um she's got loads of ammonites named after her that's amazing. Yeah, it's quite cool I really love that story <laughs> from Yorkshire so it, it, it makes me feel warm and nice. That's a really cool story. And also quite surprising that you would find ammonites in Yorkshire. So can you find them in the UK? I think our audience are also asking that question. Can you find ammonites in, in the UK? You can find them all over the UK. So a um, lot of our rocks are the right sort of age for ammonites. And they also used to be marine. So that's the key sort of two factors. Is it, is it the right age? Was it marine? And also, was it somewhere that ammonites would have been living at the time? And mm -hmm. places like, so we've got ammonites from Yorkshire. The Yorkshire coast has loads of them. Um, also, Folkestone. Um, you can find them in Dover. The Isle of Wight has some on the south coast. Um, also, more famously, Lyme Regis, very famous for its ammonites. Um, I have a gentleman who quite regularly posts me ammonites to identify for him that he finds in a potato field in Somerset. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, so they are really everywhere. Like the UK is a great place for ammonites. So if anyone lives near the sea and can go for the daily walk there, they might be able to see them, but maybe in the future it would be a good idea to have a, a look at the ammonites. This picture here is from Lyme Regis, isn't it, Zoe? That is. So this is the ammonite pavement in Lyme Regis. Um, and just a note to say, if anyone is thinking of going and looking for some fossils, do look at how to do it safely. Um, there are regulations and things. So look that up before you go. Don't just start hacking at cliffs. Just I don't want to be responsible <laughs> for themselves. Um, 
yeah so this is the ammonite pavement and the ammonite pavement is one of my most favorite places in the world um mainly because it's just this massive solid pavement that's just full of ammonites you walk around on it and it just it makes me so happy um yeah so that's the ammonite pavement and it's amazing um it's part of a triple si so a site of a special scientific interest so don't go bashing at it just go and look and take nice pictures um mm -hmm. and you do you go there often with the museum to have a look at those ammonites sorry? um yeah we do actually so um we've been doing a project myself and some colleagues across the museum and we got a call in the winter of 2016 and essentially the ammonite pavement got damaged during a storm so natural england called us to go and have a look and also offered off this the opportunity to rescue some blocks of it before they got destroyed by the sea so we went down had a bit of a recce went down the next week and um we were able to actually rescue some of those blocks with loads of help from people down in Lyme Regis, um, Jurassic Coast, and they were all amazing. Um, yeah, so hopefully some of those blocks will be going on display not too far in the future at the museum. Um, we have some plans, um, but we've also been going down quite regularly a few times a year, um, myself and a colleague from our Imaging and Analysis Centre, um, to do something called photogrammetry, where we basically take loads and loads of pictures, and then she does some amazing nifty stuff and connects them all together. So we've got these amazing 3D views of the Ammonite pavement, and we can actually track them through time to see how it's changing and what's going on. So we're sort of trying to conserve it digitally. That's really cool. So you want, uh, you don't need to go there to have a look at some of the data that you've collected as well. That's really amazing. No, good. we just have to go to collect the data really. <laughs> and that's amazing. And I think it's important to insist that at the moment, um, we're all in lockdown, we can't uh, go yeah. out and it's safer to stay at home. So it's better to wait until in the future when we can go out to have a look at, at those fossils. But in the meantime, um, yeah, we can have a look at loads of images that we have of them on plenty of museum websites, including our own. Our own. And they're, they're really, really amazing. Now, I, I'm aware that we're getting so, so many questions. We'll read, read wow. to the end of the show. And I've got one question that I actually wanted to ask you. So no, no, we know that the Ammonites um, are extinct, the Nautilus are not, um, but they might be a little bit in trouble, Nautilus are, they might be a little bit on um, disappearing slowly and it might be due to ourselves, isn't it? Yes, so um, they probably will be affected by climate change because they're a shelled animal and animals struggle to build cal uh, calcium carbonate shells when um, there's acidity in the area and also when the ocean is warmer they struggle to put it all together um but also we as a species are fascinated by beautiful things and so a lot of people have been going on holiday and buying these shells there's a market for it um now thankfully it's actually quite recent um the nautilus is now cites listed um which means that there are protections that you can't actually trade them um so hopefully that will help them a bit. But some scientists that work on recent nautiloids um, and do camera trapping things, so they stick a bait, a lure down, and basically they just feed them and film them. They've been seeing numbers massively decrease over the last few years. So it is a bit of a concern, particularly when this animal has been around for such a long time. So don't buy nautilus shells. <laughs> Even though if they're really, really pretty. Even if they're really pretty, um, it's much better to have an animal existing in the ocean, being pretty down there, then have it on your mantelpiece. Mm -hmm. And come to the museum and when we are yeah. able to and have a look at the ones that we have there. We've got yeah, them. we've got specimens there, mostly historic specimens. So we have lots of them. Or look on the internet. Watch videos no. on YouTube, that's the thing to do. They're really Those cool. are really cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're hypnotising. Uh, so we've got loads of questions, so I'm going to ask some of the questions coming from our audience this is actually quite interesting do you know by any chance who was the first person to discover ammonites do we know so the f there's, there's a difference in the first person to find one we probably have no idea um the first person to publish on them so to name the group um mm -hmm. i believe that was someone called hyatt off the top of my head, I can't remember the year that was done, but I think it was in the 18-somethings. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to keep all of this knowledge in the brain. Um, but we do have one specimen. Sadly, I don't have a picture of it that I can share. 
Um, but one of my colleagues, Adrian Lister, a couple of years ago, wrote a book all about Charles Darwin. And so he was looking into some of the invertebrate collections because we've got Darwin specimens too. Um, and he found, well, we found together this um, ammonite specimen. And when he told me that it was probably the first ammonite from South America known to science. So it's the first one to be published from South America. And Charles Darwin found it. It's got original Darwin labels on it. It's just, <laughs> it's not a beautiful specimen. It's not like a wow, oh wow, that's a perfect ammonite. It's just the history in that specimen is just so mind blowing. And one of the most amazing stories that we have, but we have loads of stories. Most of our objects mm -hmm. have amazing stories in our collections. So yeah, that's just an example. That's beautiful. I think it's the magic of the of the collections when you can find in them and the, all the yeah. history behind them. Yeah, um, when you have a bad day, you just go and find a Darwin specimen and you just go, wow, Charles Darwin found this. And it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've mentioned Darwin, but um, another important paleontologist in, in the UK is Mary Anning, and, and, and she uh, um, collected fossils around Lyme Regis. Do we know if yeah. she had any impact on, on the fossils that are in Lyme Regis? What sort of impact did they had, um, especially on ammonites? Did she collected many? um she would have collected ammonites she would have been selling them so the the little riddle sea she shell it's very hard to say um, <laughs> she sells seashells on the seashore that was about mary anning probably selling specimens like ammonites um in our collections most of the mary anning specimens in our collections are the sort of big glamorous things like ichthyosaurs um and that ilk we have a soft tissue um cephalopod so a squid like animal with some ink sac that Mary Anning um, would have found. Um, she would have had some impact on ammonites, but I don't know too much about her, to be honest. I'm not I'm not an mm -hmm. expert on the history of Mary Anning, I'm afraid. Um, I suppose her being a woman, it was always difficult for her to get any much yeah. on, on that aspect of it, even in the big, big specimens that she found, the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs. Yeah. Um, she eventually got some credit, but at the time, it was hard to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, another question as well coming in is how many species uh, were there of ammonites? That I suppose that's a very, very difficult question considering that they are all around the world. Um, that is not a number that I can pull off the top of my head. I think if someone were to go through the literature, you could probably figure that out. Um, it would be in the tens of thousands. There are so many species, but there's also a complication. So we talked earlier about the difference between male ammonites and female ammonites. Um, historically, they were given to, because they look quite different, and a lot of paleontology, um, you get different species names based on things looking different. So a lot of the male and the female ones, which are one species, are actually named as two. Um, so that complicates things, but I'd say there's probably tens of thousands. Like They're exceptionally common. They are all over the world. You've got different faunas everywhere. Um, I have no idea how many ammonites there are, quite honestly, off the top of my head. Loads. It's really, really difficult. Um, mm. And uh, another question that I find really cool is how did they get away from predators? And maybe did they have any predators? Um, they definitely had predators. So um, ammonites, in fact, all cephalopods throughout their um, evolution have been in a, a sort of evolutionary arms race with fish. Um, so we know that fish would have been eating them. Some of the bigger fish sort of pinch at them. Um, and marine reptiles, so in the Jurassic, ichthyosaurs and things, we found evidence of them in the stomach contents and things. Getting away from predators it probably depended very much on their shell shape as to how successful they were at getting away from predators. Um, so if you're quite sort of small and thin, then you'd be able to sort of nip away quite fast. fast. But if you're quite bug, like Nipponites, that big weird one, I don't know <laughs> how that would have done anything. Um, but we do have specimens in the collection. Um, just trying to think. Oh, I actually do have an ammonite on the floor next to me. Um, turn it that way. Um, so this is one someone bought me as a present. It's not from the museum. I haven't stolen it. Um, it actually has some damage about here where an animal has bitten into it, broken through that siphon call, upset the balance and the buoyancy. And that's probably a good way to get your tasty ammonite out of the shell. So there is evidence of predation. And as far as getting away from predators, I've probably depended. They've sort of nip away move, as they move generally. Mm -hmm. And you've been talking about the, the shape of the shells, which actually linked really well with one of the questions that um, we've received 
an audience, which is what's the deal with the heteromorph ammonites? So the ones that have those weird shapes and why are they such a weird shape? Do we know? Um, evolution would have caused that to happen. Um, they aren't the most successful of ammonites. It probably wasn't the best way to live. So the bottom one next to me is an ammonite that's looked a bit sort of like this. Don't know how that was beneficial. Um, the two on the side furthest away from us are actually nautiloids. So Nautilus started straight and then started coiling up around the Devonian. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. In fact, science doesn't really have that much of an idea about how some of these lived. Um, there's some quite weird hypotheses out there because we haven't really dug into how these guys were living. Um, people can't agree at all on what was going on. So we don't really know. They're just sort of weird. Mm -hmm. And you've uh, you've I mentioned that the the long um, kind of like tube shaped one that we've got at the top right, um, yeah. that is a nautilus. Were there any ammonites that had that kind of a cone shape shell? Um, yes. Yeah. So there is um, a group of ammonites called baculites. You find those a lot in um, North America. So around South Dakota, um, in somewhere called Pierre Shales, you find bits of baculite. They seem to be one of the more successful heteromorphs um based on sort of numbers of them um, but um yeah so they could be straight they could be sort of coiled they could sort of turn into weird knots um there's one called creosaurus i think it is that's sort of like a big sort of spirally thing mm -hmm. um some of them are really really bizarre bizarre but beautiful i think every time yeah. i see them i just get amazed by them yeah they're quite amazing and so we have a very cool question uh coming okay. through um, we might not know this because, again, only with the shells, I think this might be really difficult. But do we know how did ammonites went to the toilet or did ammonites go to the toilet? Um, this is not something I have ever considered, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, probably in a very similar way to modern octopuses, which I believe they, oh, do you know? I'm not sure. I don't know. I think they, I think they excrete into their mantle cavity and sort of flush it out with water. I think that's how they do it um it's not mm. something i've ever considered i'll be honest about that <laughs> maybe it could be a good um topic of yeah. a study for the future <laughs> yeah possibly i don't know <laughs> that's really tricky um now uh zoe again uh, we're reaching to the end of the questions if we have um, any other questions please send them through we'll try to get through as many as possible um cool. but before we say goodbye to our audience, I wanted to ask you a bit of a more serious question. Why do you think it's important to study fossil ammonites and living relatives like the Nautilus today? So um, a lot of invertebrate fossils can actually give us a lot of ideas about climate change and things. So um, this is sort of on two fronts. One, we can look at size changes. So when times get hard in shelled animals, they tend to shrink. Um, a lot of groups do. Um, We've seen this in brachiopods and we we haven't, I think we've seen it in ammonites. I don't know if too many studies about that have happened. Um, but you can also look at where you've got shell preservation. So like my little specimen that I have to hand here, where you've got shell preservation, if it's really good preservation, you can actually do um, chemistry on the shell. And because all of the ingredients almost to make the shells come from the ocean, you can get a picture of what, the ocean was like and you can even use that analysis to see what ocean temperatures were like so we can really use these animals to see what was going on in the past when times were hard in times of sort of extinction and crisis um we can also get ideas about sort of just general ecology of what was going on in different areas um through different times so yeah they're really important and also they've been used quite a lot as for something called biostratigraphy they are so common and they also evolve so rapidly that they change bed by bed in the rocks. So you can use them if you know how old a certain ammonite is. If you find one of those with an ichthyosaur, and I have been asked to do this sort of identifications, um, if you know what the ammonite is that goes with the ichthyosaur, you can then date the ichthyosaur. So that's quite useful. But we tend to do a bit less of that these days, I think. So they are really, really important and key for to knowing more about uh, at the past. Now, we've been talking about um the the predators that predated on on ammonites what was the um, defense or offense mechanism this is also another question coming from our, our viewers um so i think there 
they're sort of defense mechanisms. Some of them had spines. So obviously you're a bit less tasty taste if you've got hard shell spines. Um, they didn't have any sort of weaponry or anything. They didn't have any ink. Um, it's only the coleoids that have ink. Um, yeah, they probably sort of ran away or made themselves less appealing by having spines and ribs. So a lot of these sort of ribs that you see on some of the shells, so the little lines on the shells, um, those would have strengthened the shell against predation. Also, spines would obviously put, put you off. You're not going to want to go and bite a hedgehog, for instance. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, Zoe, this is a tricky question, but do you think oh. could, there could be still ammonites out there waiting to be discovered? This is coming from an audience, and I suppose it has two sides. Ammonites that are fossil ammonites, but also maybe any living ammonites that we've never found? Okay, so I'll answer the easier part of that question first. Um, <laughs> yes, there are almost certainly new species of fossil ammonites out there. Um, there are loads of fossil ammonites. Um, we won't have found them all. And yeah, there'll be loads out there ready to be discovered. There's people publishing new species of ammonites all the time. Um, in terms of are they still around? That would be exceptionally doubtful. The Earth has undergone so many dramatic changes in the 66 million years. Um, yes, there are stories of Lazarus, Lazarus species like coelacanths coming back, but I would find that exceptionally hard to believe, to be honest, that they there has been ammonites hiding away from us. Also, they were so common at one point. I don't know. I find it, I, I would love it, but um, yeah, I find that quite hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Now, so we, we really need to finish the show now. I'd love to stay here and talk to you throughout yeah, the morning. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to ask you the very, very, very last question from the show, which also yeah. um, came from an audience. Uh, you're an amazing scientist. You're an amazing communicator as well. But um, why did you want to become a scientist? Um, I don't think I ever sat down at any point and went, I was like, oh, maybe I did. I've always... <laughs> really enjoyed science um it was always something i wanted to do i think throughout school my whether i liked biology chemistry or physics changed very much with who was teaching me some teachers you always will get on with better than others um yeah i actually went to university to study pharmacology because at the time i went wow. to university i really liked chemistry turned out i wasn't very good at that so i was at a great university that allowed you to figure these sorts of things out so I did a sort of general life science first year um, and I switched into zoology because actually I really loved all of those things and I was quite good at it um, yeah I just I've always loved science and I like finding out things um, about the world um, I'm also like organizing things so that <laughs> very nicely so yeah yeah I think it was always something that I probably was going to end up doing I don't think I, I, think ever I want to be a scientist. But you found a job that really, really fit with all the things that you like, it looks like. Yeah, completely. Like, <laughs> I love my job. I'm really missing the museum. Um, but it's good that I do have things that I can get on with at home. So, mm -hmm. And it's really great that you're always happy to come and join us in, in shows like this and talk oh, about doing this sort of thing. as well. <laughs> I know you do. And it's brilliant. And it's been uh, brilliant having you with us today on nature life and hopefully we'll have you again in the future thank you so much so for oh, joining thank you. Today. thank you for answering so many questions um, right. <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining us for nature life today to talk about ammonites thank you thank you so much to sending uh, for sending all the questions and i know that we haven't gone through all of the questions that you've sent but zoe you are quite active on twitter so, is, yep. <laughs> and you've told me that you're happy for people to contact you on there. So yep. you have two uh, museum Twitter accounts, Brachiopods, yep. which are um, a kind of a specimen that you look after, and Kefalobots, which includes yep. the ammonites and nautilus, and also your own personal Twitter account. I very rarely use my personal one. <laughs> so, con so contact her on the other ones. If you have any questions that we have an answer, you really, really want to know the answer to, please uh, get in touch with us. But again, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really hope you enjoyed the show. Um, I really, really enjoyed having Zoe here. Uh, but we have so many other shows uh, prepared for you uh, for the future. We're doing Nature Live online on Fridays at 10.30, like today, and on Tuesdays at 12 
um, midday just uh, for ready for lunch. So please join us on those shows. The next broadcast will be next Tuesday, the 5th of May at 12 p.m. during lunchtime. And we'll be talking about modern naturalists. So if you've been looking out of your window, having a look at uh, the plants that you can see out there, the birds, the bees, maybe join us on Tuesday and find out more about how all the scientists going on about uh, finding out more about the natural world. But until then, I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. It's been a pleasure to have Zoe and all of you with us today. I'm Christina. This was Nature Life Online. And see you soon. Bye. Bye.